Praise the Lord, everyone. God bless you. It is so good to be here on this wonderful Sunday. Uh, what is this? April 14th in the year of our Lord. Uh, Myra and I had the opportunity to hang out with um, our good friends over at New Life Evangelical Baptist Church. Uh, over um, on, off of North Avenue in Baltimore. And as always, we are always treated like royalty there. And we want to give a shout out to um, uh, Reverend Williams, Reverend Milton Williams, the pastor, and also uh, Lady Moore, Sister Moore, Ima Jean Moore, and, um, and everybody else that makes up that congregation again. Um, we are always treated so well, and it's always a pleasure um, when we have an opportunity to come by. And so we're here now, having enjoyed a wonderful mm -hmm. lunch. And um, I told Myra, I said, you know, I feel so comfortable in my um, faith, and I don't know if I can see it, faith, not fear shirt. I said, I want to keep this thing on because it was given to me by a very special young lady by the name of Patricia Vaughn, who um, lives in our uh, condo community. And um, I love this t-shirt and I wear it all the time. So, um, and I think it's apropos that, you know, she got this understanding exactly who I am because it's all about that faith and not being uh, fearful of anything that man can bring. So that was my preamble to just uh, get us opened up. I am now going to be quiet. I'm going to turn things over to my beloved Myra, and she will pray us in and get us started. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. Thank you for another day your hands have made. We rejoice in it and are exceedingly glad. Thank you for the theme that we have this day that was uh, put forth by one of our faithful members. And we thank you for the opportunity to talk about this theme and encourage others and ourselves, Father, because you cannot seek the Lord and read his word and spend time with him without learning something and growing deeper in your faith. So thank you, Father, for all things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, the word we have today is dependence. And when I looked it up in the, the Worldly Dictionary, it just says relying or controlled by someone or something. And the similar words they wrote down was helpless, weakness, subservient. But when you look in the biblical definition of it, it just changes it like 190 degrees. It says the biblical definition exists by virtue of a necessary relation. Exists to live, trusting, obeying, being led by him, empowered by the Holy Spirit for life and ministry, which we know is one. Giving God control of every aspect of my life, my decisions, my family, my finances, my everything. And does that sound like we're helpless? Are we weak? Are we subservient? Mm. We're servants. But see how the world changes that? It, it just, it's true, but it's not the truth. Because in Christ, it changes, dependence changes into something vital for all of us. In Lamentations 3, 21, 23, it says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. We are alive. That's my words. We are alive. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So we're depending right there on life for him, by him. Because without him, we don't have any life. So it's like having oxygen and you're having trouble breathing. And someone takes that oxygen away, you're going to die. Well, he is the breath of life to us. So we depend upon him for life. But it goes deeper than that. 
uh, Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Show your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Now that comes from Psalm 119, which is a lot of the scriptures I'm, I refer to. Because it says we need to trust in the Lord. And that's part of being dependent. It, it, it means we trust this person. We trust this relationship. And we're relying on him. But we need to obey him. Because if he's going to direct our path, then we need to understand the direction he wants us to go. Uh, one of the Psalms says, How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? With my whole heart I have sought you, or let me not wander from your commandments. And that, that word, that really caught my attention because in Psalm 119, 19, I'm sorry, says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's 119.11. The word of God is living within us. It says, In the beginning, out, we're in the New Testament now, was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So we're back in Old Testament again, back in Genesis. It says, He was in the beginning with God. That's Genesis. All things were made through Him. That's back to Genesis, all the way through to the end. We're part of that. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. He gave us light. Not only life, but life. And the word, the definition for word, it says God's word is either spoken or written. It's alive and gives us life. Because there's a scripture, I don't remember where it is, but it says, Jesus said it. He says, men seek the word to, to for knowledge. But that's not all the word is. It's a lie. It's not in a book. They read the scriptures. That's what it says. For knowledge and, and, and enlightenment is not the word they use. But to, to be maybe better than they could be of themselves. But more for their head knowledge. To puff themselves up. But that's, what, what, that's not what the word is for. It's to give us life. It says in Hebrews that the word means one of the definitions is talk. So you can't put talk on a page. So that, that means the word is not only written, but it, it is, you can hear it in your, in your ear. Because it says the, the word is closer to us than it was before. That as we grow, the word is nearer to us. It's in our ear. We can hear it. We don't have to go to a book. But the, the book is there. The word is there. But it just becomes more and more alive and it's no longer on the page. It's in our hearts. In the, in the Greek, the definition of the word is logos, and that means law, mm -hmm. a rule of conduct. And so in, that's, in Psalms 119, there's so many different passages that just drew my attention. It says, blessed are the undefiled in the way, as you're walking, and that's purity, undefiled, who walk in the law of the Lord. And the law is God's perfect standard of obedience and holiness is all part of our dependence. As a child, uh, when we, we were born, we did whatever we wanted because we didn't know any better. We just laid there and somebody came along and changed us and gave us milk. But that someone became, or well, probably was before we were born, the relationship between the mom and the baby. They know one another. And that child looks to that person, is depending upon that person to change them when they cry, to give them something to eat. And that's part of that childlike relationship we should have with, with, with our Lord and Savior. He said, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do not iniquity. They walk in his ways. We're, we're walking in that path that he is directing us. He's guiding us. We're depending upon him to enable us to go in the right direction. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. 
And what is a precept? It's another commandment. It's instruction. It's order. Intended as a rule of conduct. This is, you know, so where does that, that worldly definition that we're subservient with, we, we, we're following someone that we're under their command, this is a relationship. The biblical sense of dependence is based on our heart, not on our knowledge. Because someone can be your teacher and you say, oh, they have so much knowledge, I'm going to follow them. But this is not about man's knowledge, it's about the faithfulness of God. How he wants to direct us and, and for our good. It says, blessed are those who keep his testimonies. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep his statutes. And those are rules too, but it's set in stone. Because it's given to God. God does not change. It's set in stone. The, the principles that were set in stone in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, he meant every word. But he also knew we didn't have the power, the ability to be obedient. But this is the 119th Psalm is written by, some people think David, but this indication is, is written by a number of different people of those days. But they're seeking after, they know there's something. They know God, but it's deeper than just knowing God. And they're looking at, what shall I do? How can I act? I hear what you say, I want to do this. I will do this, I will do that. Don't forsake me. It says, deal bountifully with your servant. They understood they were servants, that I may live and keep your word. It says, may, that I may live, that I may keep your word. It's no real stability there. It says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from you. They're seeking, they're seeking. I am a stranger in the earth. They understand the principles. But they don't really know how to walk it out. But they, they ask him to be taught. It says, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, the rule of law, and I shall keep it to the end. Did they? No. Give me understanding, I shall keep your law. Did they? Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Did they? Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in them to a certain extent. But are we prisoners? Are we slaves? To a certain extent. But we also have a liberty. It says, I will walk at liberty for I seek your precepts. They understood this. Because true liberty is freedom from guilt of sin and condemnation. That's where we get into Jesus. All this is speaking from Jesus. Old Testament has a foundation in Christ. Because John says, in the beginning, he was. He was there. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I said, love that scripture. I still love it. Because it's the path that he wants us to walk on. Everything is there. And it even it, the, the 156 verse, because it's the, the biggest psalm in the, in, the, in the Bible. It's the biggest uh, chapter in the Bible. He says, great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. But the, I love the way in, in the King James it says, quicken me. Because basically they're saying that we're, we're dead. Yeah. We're not really alive. We want all this. But there's something in, our, in us that is not. We want, we understand. We understand what you're saying. But help us, help us, help. They want this guidance. They want to, to, to encourage others to follow the Lord. Because they understand there is a salvation. He is our salvation. And then when they talk about the judgment, revive me according to your judgment, people use that word like, oh, that's condemnation or just a damnation. But it's not. It could be a reward. It could be a punishment. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be something bad. His judgments can be good. So in the King James Version, this is where I've been coming from. But in John 14, 26, it says, after Christ, his sacrifice, his life, his death, his resurrection, Jesus is telling them before he goes to be with his Father, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 
remember Jesus is basically his ministry was to the Jews. But salvation was for everyone. And he was he was almost like a John the Baptist, but he was better than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a precursor of Christ, but there no there was no one like Jesus. But he left it in the hands by the order of our God and Father to do his part. And then the Father sent the Holy Spirit to live within us, to encourage us, to teach us, if we would only listen. That's the thing. In 1 Peter 1 says, if we wanted to be dependent, and you have to want to. I love the way he says, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. And we know Old Testament, they, they wore skirts, not like they wear them now to be feminine. It was just part of the attire. And when they had to do something really heavy or, or, or strong, they had to move something. They would take pieces of their uh, cloth and they would tie it up between their legs and then tuck it under. So it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because that's what we need to understand. The word mm. of God through Jesus Christ is alive. It's real. It's, it's just not a part of history. It is history. It's our history. It's our life. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. Because we were all ignorant at one time. But we are no longer ignorant. The word is there. We hear it. We, we read it. It's, we can't say, I didn't know. I mean, even this generation who may never been to church, never heard the word of God other than in a, in a blasphemous way. They can flip the, the radio and it can stop at a gospel. They can be flipping TV and it can stop at a gospel. And we've heard of people doing that and receiving Christ because the word is there. But as he who called you is holy, it says you also be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. That's the, But how can we do that? We have to be dependent on him. In 2 Peter 1, it says, Grace and peace be multipl multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have it all. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the d divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust this is not new the Jewish people were dealing with the same temptations the same evils that are present in this in this age the only reason it seems so in our face now is because they didn't they didn't have television <laughs> They didn't have radio, they didn't have newspaper, but all those things existed. And it, it, in a way it's more dangerous because people are succumbing to it and it's, being, it's, in, it's putting technicolors, it's enticing. But if we're depending upon Jesus, we're, protect, we're depending upon God, we're depending upon the Holy Spirit, we should have reverent fear of walking away from all that he has provided for us. These promises, these, these blessings of being at rest, at peace, holy as he is holy, not to make us, our heads big, as they say in Spanish, cabezona, like a, like a cabbage head. Mm. No, but our hearts will be expanded, that we will have compassion and love and and even tears of mercy for others that don't know of Christ, that we would forsake those things that would so easily beset us and walk in the ways of God, that not only be an example, but reach our hand out to others, not just to help them up for a day, but to help them up to come to an eternal relationship with him. 
It says, be fruitful in our growth. That's being fruitful. But the word continues in, in 2 Peter, but also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. He's not talking to sinners, unbelievers. He's talking to us. Because we can be short-sighted. We can be blinded. Because he says, well, I'm, I'm not perfect. That's That's the... That used to be the major thing. I'm not perfect. But we serve a perfect God who just wants us to follow him, depend upon him, understand that he has given us the breath of life and that without that breath of life, we wouldn't be alive and that we can breathe him. We can breathe him in and take him in, not only in our ears, in our hearts, in our minds, and walk the path that he has directed us to go because we're dependent upon him. I don't want to go to the right. I don't want to go to the left. Help me to go to directly. And it's a narrow way, but it leads to him. It says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Imagine that. But so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we are pilgrims here. This is not our home. And our conduct is not based on the world. Our conduct is based on our dependence on him. That we can trust him. That we can depend on him to give us the direction to show us the path. But we have to get out of the way and understand that within us lives the Holy Spirit. And he's not sleeping. Hmm. He is alive. And he speaks to us if we listen. And when we see something that we know is not good for us, like he says, no, don't do that. Don't, don't listen to that. We had a testimony last night. This guy mm. said he was watching something he had his own issues, which made him weak anyway. And he was watching something that was really bad. And he watched it for hours, all night long. And what did it do for him? It just brought him back to darkness. It just brought up these horrible feelings within him. And he, he just kept hurting himself and walking in things that were destructive. So I know the Internet... You're, you're reading something of God's word and something pops up and you go, oh, but you need to delete that. <laughs> Don't be, you know, the enemy is, is he's, he's slick. He knows how to get to us. He likes to surprise us, but let's surprise him and say, I'm diligent in my faith in God. I'm dependent upon him to help me to Turn that off and get back to what I need to be listening to, what I need to be feeding off of. Because my life, my everything belongs to him. My decisions, my joy, my peace, my finances, everything belongs to God. And he will direct each and every path that we go on if we only are diligent to listen to the spirit that he has given us. He has given us everything we need to live a life that is pleasing to God by our, in, our dependence, not independence, our dependence upon him. Amen. 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 Praise God. Wow. You know, um, it's so funny. I was teasing Myra 
um, as we were getting ready to get started, I was uh, looking over at the number of pages that she <laughs> had as far as notes are concerned. I was getting a little concerned myself, like, oh, uh, will I get a chance to speak today or not? But I uh, know um, she's, she, as always, um, you know, she brings those uh, scripture references and everything like that. And um, I am just so excited that you know, God has joined us in a way that we come from two different perspectives on every subject that you guys give us. But in the end, it still knits itself perfectly together. And that can only be God. And um, I was thinking about this word uh, dependence. It was uh, submitted by Pearl Ross who I believe is actually a friend of my wife's. Mm -hmm. um, and so she, it's her fault <laughs> that we're, mm -hmm. we are um, covering this word today. Um, and I, you know, the, my first inclination is to, uh, oh, let me give a shout out real quick. Hey, Robert, good to see you, man. Um, my, my first inclination is always, well, let's see how many times this word shows up in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I think it was only one time and then there were some cross references that hinted at it. But when I actually sought God on this word and, and, and how this word should be shared, it made me realize that every book of the Bible demonstrates one's dependency mm -hmm. on him. <laughs> so you can almost go anywhere in the scriptures and, and get an idea that we are the creation mm -hmm. and he is the creator. Never shall the creation uh, outdo the creator mm -hmm. never will the creator need the creation but the creation always needs the creator mm -hmm. thus we talk about dependence mm -hmm. uh, so um I, when i sent this out as a facebook event i threw in three questions and i'm going to go ahead and address the questions and the answers to those questions right now. Um, so the first question that I sent was, what is the biblical definition of dependence? And the answer was, dependence on God means we need him and we understand that without him, we are unable to accomplish anything of kingdom significance. Mm -hmm. Reliance on Jesus is the door to faithful and fruitful living. It means we are transformed by what the Lord says and thinks. Therefore, we can depend on him for wisdom and insight. Question number two was, what is the greatest threat to your dependency on God? And I found this quote from a gentleman, I hope I'm not butchering his name, but his first name is Kerry, uh, and uh, last name is, uh, I think it's Newolf. I think that's how it's pronounced. And yes, uh, Robert, yes, John 15. Excellent, excellent point there. Thank you very much. In fact, we I think we were in John 15 uh, recently mm -hmm. in uh, some of the things that we shared. Uh, but but honestly, I'm coming from a whole different place. Um, uh, so just hang in there for a moment. But um, this comment from Carrie Newolf says this, the greatest threat to your dependence on God is your current success. Mm. And, and Myra hinted at this. Um, it's when... We think that we are the ones that are accomplishing anything is when we have actually rejected our dependency on 
God or Jesus Christ. Um, this is the one time it is perfectly okay to be dependent. Mm -hmm. um, I know we all fight for independence. I mean, when, when I was growing up, I, I wanted to be independent from my parents. The, the moment, Robert, I'm going to talk to you. The moment that I was old enough to be able to work and to be able to leave my father and mother's house, man, I couldn't leave there fast enough only to realize that once I got out into the big bad world, oh, wait a minute, every responsibility that I had not considered fell on me. And those things had some crazy results and, and, and because Robert I see you you're clicking in so I'm I'm a, I'm a talk to everybody but I'm talking to you right now you know like I know that being given the big head and thinking that you can do everything and that you have a, a, a independence that's separated from God gets you in trouble okay and we all get in trouble in different ways you've been in trouble I've been in trouble too I lived a life for 29 years that was constantly in trouble because I wanted to be independent. And the moment that I gave up my independence in order to be dependent on the true and living God, what a thing happened in my life that my God, I got revelation of everything that God had planned in my life and I could not believe that a holy living almighty God could be that concerned about me personally and when I then think about how that multiplies to the gazillion amount of people that have ever been on this earth and we don't know how many more are yet to come. And this one God, one God, we all, whether we choose to accept it or not, we are all dependent on him. So I thought about it when uh, this Carrie uh, Newolf is talking about our current success because we tend to equate what's good and bad in our lives based upon our successes. And what I've come to understand is that it's been in my dependence, dependence, when things weren't so good is when I actually experienced God fully and directly when I could hear his voice. In moments of sheer success, we tend to blot out God because we are basking in the accolades that the world has given us, the attaboys, the man, you are bad today, all these kind of things. I, I'm not hating on people that encourage each other. I'm, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying you do not believe your own press because we have to remember that no matter what we've been able to do, we might have sang that song like it's never been sung before. We might have shared a word or a testimony that just blew everybody out of the water. But at the end of the day, there's none of that without God. And we are dependent on him for our very being. We think the alarm clock wakes us up. We think, you know, when I tap Myra on the shoulder and say, it's time to get up, honey, we think that's what's waking us up, but no, no, no. God is the one who decides and determines whether we will have life each and every day. And when he gives us this opportunity to live, then we have to then ask, what are we living for? What shall I render to Jehovah? For he has done so very much for me. So what, sh what can I give back to him? Because I'm totally dependent on him, which means I need him to give me direction. I need him to talk to me about 
where I should be going, who I should be serving, where should I be uh, spending my time? Because my time is supposed to be utilized to glorify him, everything that we do. And so um, that third question was, how important is humility the place of entire dependence on God? Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm reading my answer in the question. Let me uh, backtrack. How important is humility in one's dependency on God? And isn't this something that, uh, you know, back in the days of Christ, they were looking for a, a, a deliverer, for a, a savior, for a warrior, for a king who would be uh, in his armor and would be on a stallion and would come in. And in those days, the enemy was Rome and he would just go in there and take care of Rome and take away the, the humiliation of the, the horrible taxation that they were going through and the paganism that they had to endure that was going against their faith. And this warrior would come in and save the day like Superman, right? And Jesus came in on a cult, low esteem, humble, meek, lowly at heart. And it blew the world away because we all have an image of who we think our savior should be. There are people right now, maybe even listening here, we, we, we look towards men and women to represent things that only God can represent. We're, we're looking, for instance, from our politicians, we're looking for our politicians to somehow also be priests. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that it's never going to happen because that whole system is not designed by God. And so can you have someone who actually loves God in that system? Well, we know that you can because people like Daniel was in that system. People like Joseph were in that system and they learned how to maneuver in that system and still represent God well. But I would never ever put my reliance on a human being when God is still crying out like he did with the Israelites I want to be your king I want to be the one that you you call on for your needs I want to be the one that leads you and we keep calling for Saul we keep calling for Barabbas we keep calling for everything other than the true and living God, who is saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we think that when things are not working out right, that somehow God has forgotten us. But we have a limited memory because we forget the many times that we've forsaken him. All right. And, and I just got to be straight up with this. I haven't even gotten to the scripture yet. But, but this is so important to understand that um, in a relationship, it is a two-way thing going on. A relationship, you cannot have one partner that's doing everything and you doing nothing. In, in this marriage that you see here, I don't do everything for Myra. She doesn't do everything for me. We find prayerfully the middle ground in which we are both uh, actually showing a dependency, that word, for each other as we both are dependent on Christ. Go to Ephesians 5 to understand what I'm talking about. And so in that same way, none of us should walk around here thinking that we're all that because we are nothing. We're still the filthy rags. Just because grace has come to give us a redemption from the penalty of sin does not mean that we're still in our natural bodies, not still the filthy rags that God 
had referred to in the old covenant. That's who we are. And if we understand that that's who we are, and it's only by his grace that we are saved through faith and not anything of ourselves, then we can approach this whole thing of dependency not as a weakness, but it's your power. It's the power that God has given you to show that, man, the moment that I decrease, he increases. But when he increases, guess what? He takes us with him. You understand? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power we can have. And it can raise us from all kinds of things. Thank God Pearl is with us now. This is your lesson, Pearl. So we're going to give it to you straight up. This dependency cannot be contained in a few Bible verses. The whole Bible proves that we are dependent on God. God gives us an identity. Without God's uh, 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 input in our lives, we are filthy. We are dirt. We are disgusting. But with him, we become this royal priesthood, not because we deserve it, not because somehow or another we had advanced to something higher than other human beings, but because God's grace is sufficient. And if we could understand how God loves us, he takes us, we are worthless, but he takes us and he gives us credibility. And it's that credibility that, oh my gosh, it, it, it truly aims us in the direction of knowing that we must be dependent on God. I didn't even answer the question, but here was the question. How important is humility to, in one's dependency on God? Very important. Humility, the place of entire dependence on God is the first duty and the highest virtue of the creature. Remember who we are. We're the creature. We will never be creators. We're the creature. And then it says, and the root of every virtue. And, and that word virtue, I'm going to give you Max definition, but that word virtue speaks to the very essence, the very nature of someone. And when that virtue from Christ was being released like it was being done to the woman with the issue of blood in the midst of a crowd of people that were knocking him all about, the only time that he ever turned around was when the virtue came out of him. And we should be like that woman with the issue. She did an uncommon thing at an uncommon period of the, of the day to be a woman of, of, of all things and to press her way through the throng of people just to get a touch of his garment. It, it, it wasn't about anything other than that. You don't hear any uh, exchange between Jesus and the woman. All he said is, I feel that virtue coming out of me. And at that moment, that woman was immediately healed from a 12 year ordeal in her natural body. And if God will do that through Christ for her before he was even referred to as the Christ. Imagine what he does for us now in this dispensation of grace that we've been given. When we draw nigh to him, his virtue is what we become dependent on because he gives us the status of being royalty, royalty in his eyes. We're the ones that will sit at his table at the end time. We're the ones that will be uh, 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 supping with him at the table with our enemies looking around wondering, how did they get to that place, that intimacy with God? And this is what it's all about. I see you, Janae. 
This is what it's all about. So let me get, oh, oh let me finish off. Uh, it says, and so pride or the loss of humility is the root of every sin and evil. So again, the more we try to take credit, <laughs> the more we are opening the portal for wickedness and evilness to enter in. It's time to shut that door. And so I, I'm going to transition really quickly. I honestly, guys, I didn't even know any of this that I just said was going to come up. This was unscripted. Um, but let's uh, bring it to the word because we don't do anything just out of what Mac O'Meara says. Uh, we, we validate this with the word of God. Uh, so for me, I wanted to just find one passage of scripture that would kind of show this dependence. And I had to go to my favorite, my favorite guy other than Jesus in the, in the scriptures, Paul. Anybody that knows me knows I'm always going there. Like um, he is, uh, he's uh, what the kids say. He's my dude. He's my dude. Um, so I'm going to take you guys to Philippians chapter one, and I'm going to just kind of go through verses 12 through 26. I'm going to break it up a little bit. Um, but we have to understand that in Philippians one, we see uh, the apostle Paul, he is actually writing this letter and the historians, the scholars, they say that at this time, he was actually still in prison in Rome. And so even with that, I love uh, Philippians because it has some of the, the most time treasured passages in that book. But at the very beginning, it's just Paul expressing his thanks for the Philippians. And, uh, you know, but with that thanks, he also was still concerned that there wouldn't be evil practices that would sneak their ugly heads into the assembly. Um, and so he's writing this from Rome and it's an impassioned book. That, that's why we, we, we quote it so much, because it's an impassioned book. We, we actually see Paul in a more passionate way than some of the other epistles. And so uh, in verse 12, it says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident by my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Guys, let me tell you, I just had me an old happy party when I when I, I read that section because again Paul was currently in prison on house arrest in Rome and funny thing is, it, the Romans, after Paul made his case, because Paul was sharing, you got to understand, Paul was sharing the gospel to the Jew and to the Gentile with no shame, no, no, no padding of the word at all. He was that bold. And even the Romans, pagans, y'all, even the Romans were impressed and truly 
did not want to keep him in prison. Ah, but his own, his, his Jewish brethren, the leadership, not all Jews, but the leadership, you know, they spoke against his release. And Paul ended up having to plead his case before the Jewish council. And in his plea, he was trying to show them what we try to show y'all today, that this Jesus, the same Jesus is the one who was prophesied in the Mosaic law of the old covenant. This same Jesus is in the new covenant and he always has been. As we heard in service today in John 1, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So Jesus has always been there in a form of, in that time of being the word. The word, remember, was then made flesh and dwelt among us as Jesus. And he ascended as Christ and he's coming back as Christ for us who uh, remain on this earth at the time of his coming. And so he's doing all this and he's preaching the gospel to Jew and, and Gentile alike, but he's making this case before uh, the Jewish brethren. And of course, like you find out in many parts of scripture, there was a bunch of murmuring and disputes. Because guys, when you share the truth, and if you have that many people on your bandwagon, something's wrong with your truth because the truth of Christ hurts because most of the people are of the world. And if you don't say things to offend, and Myra will tell you, I'm always getting myself in trouble somewhere by sharing the truth. Real quick thing, I've been going back and forth on a subject I won't talk about here publicly, but I made one comment in love about a particular subject and man, the posse came after me, not with the Bible, but with personal accusations and even uh, uh, comments, negative comments about my mental state. And I'm saying, oh, this is the way that we converse one with another. You're saying that you're of Christ. I'm saying I'm of Christ because I disagree with you doesn't mean that I'm disagreeable with you. But we can all see things in different ways and yet love one another. And what I'm saying, y'all, is that the reason why I probably go to Paul more than anybody else because I see him as one who always took the hit, no matter what, no matter what the audience is, for the greater good of the gospel because of his dependency on Christ. When he was on that Damascus road, he thought he was all that and God had to humble him. He blinded him. It's, and, and, and he took away his sight in order for uh, Paul to finally see that this Jesus, the one whom he had been railing against, the one who he had persecuted, is the one who would save him and is, in fact, the savior of the world. And I want to say something else, which made him by Jesus' uh, uh, purposes, the new 12th disciple after Judas went away. We know about Matthias. Matthias was brought in by man through the casting of lots, but Jesus is the one who called Paul. And that makes him a very special person in the grand scheme of things based upon his genealogy, based upon his nationality, based upon his status as both a Jew and as a citizen of Rome, 
God knew exactly what he was doing when he put Paul there, which is why you can attribute the majority of the new covenant somewhere or another to Paul's influence because Paul took over middle way through the book of Acts and almost dominates the rest of the new covenant in his writings. And that's not by happenstance because that man uh, represents more than anybody else I could think of in the natural world. The reason why we should be dependent on Christ. And so um, for you guys that want to know more about this thing I was talking about with Paul in prison and sharing um, these uh, this gospel with Jew and Gentile alike, you can go to Acts 28 verses 16 through 31 for sake of time. Um, I'm not going to read that, but, but you read that in your own study. So then let me continue on. I'm still in Philippians one. I'm now at Philippians one verse 15. It says some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill. The former Preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter, out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. And so even as we use that, that verse, you know, we use it out of context. There's a specific context here um, but let me go ahead because I, I I don't want to stray too far off the real subject, dependence. But Paul was uh, so bold in his preaching that he shared Christ with his Roman captors and with the Jews. Because of his boldness, many began to preach the gospel. However, some with false intent, but others with sincere love for the truth. For that, uh, in your own personal time, you can go to Luke chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. And, and what's really being said here is, is that because of the boldness that Paul was demonstrating, and I'm going to make it more personal. I'm going to talk to Pearl right now. I think Pearl is still with us. Pearl, because of your personal conviction to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you might not have understood it before we had this chat right now, but you have the influence through your holy boldness to actually motivate people with good and bad intentions to still share the gospel. And what's really being said here is that not that we condone people that aren't sharing the gospel correctly. We don't encourage that, but we do see the benefits that as long as the word is being spoken, those who had that love for the gospel and are sharing the truth, we can go out there and we can share it correctly, even if that means that we have to correct some folk that got it wrong. So in other words, we, we end up pushing the word even further out there because if we hear something that's of a misstep, misguided, we can go and say, hey, such and such person had great intent, but the Bible is really saying 
this or that. And when we do that, it makes it so more people are able to go out there with a holy boldness and to share the word of God. Believers, followers of the way, we have been sitting on the sidelines way too long because we feel like we haven't been adequately equipped. But in our dependency, God will give you the word specifically for you to then go out and to share with others. And we should never be afraid. When Myra and I, uh, during the pandemic, when we started this whole thing going all the way back to 2020, uh, neither one of us knew what we were doing. We just said, you know what? Um, we didn't necessarily agree with all the churches shutting down. And so we were going to go out there and we were going to give people an alternative. If they weren't going to the churches, we we're going to bring the churches to them online. That was the motivation. And we continue to do that even with the buildings now open again. We continue to do that because we still feel that this is the calling that God has for us right now. And it's only been through our dependency on him and the dependency that we all have to hear his word that we're able to do this week after week after week with the boldness to say things that might challenge what you might be hearing in your own uh, assemblies. Nevertheless, we believe in the gospel of truth and we will share that truth, not based upon what Myra thinks or what Mac thinks, but based upon what the word of God says. And we have scripture references to always back us up. Why? Because again, we're dependent on God's word. So let me wrap this up. So comes to my favorite part, starting again, still in Philippians 1, but at verse 19, it says, for I know this, or I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And Paul is giving us this tug of war between his earthly ministry and his eternal existence with Christ. He acknowledges his desire for the latter, which is to be with Christ, but recognizes that there is still work yet to be done on earth in sharing the gospel to all who hear. And I'll finish off the verses and then um, just kind of expound and then we're done may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by coming to you again. So Paul is saying that he has this desire, he, he's itching to get out of that prison and to come and visit because the ministry for him is real. And if he's going to remain in this earth, he wants to be as productive as possible. And did you notice 
No time did he make any kind of plea for his own personal needs or desires. Everything, everything, everything was about the kingdom and the pressing forth of the gospel of truth. That's the way that we live. That's right, Pearl. Help us to finish this race. Because here's the thing, Pearl. I'm glad you said that. Because in a, a race that's on this earth, we know there's a starting point and there's an ending point. And you know at that ending point, they usually have this rope or something that once you cross it, you determine who's won the race. Okay, everybody's going the same distance. If you're on a track, you're going the same distance. And everybody's going to finish. They might finish first. They might finish in 20th place, 150th place. But here's the thing. This race, we're all starting at different points in this gospel race. And so we don't know when we finish. So because we don't know, we're dependent, your word, Pearl, we're dependent on Christ to help us to finish. You're right. And he helps us each and every day, every day, excuse me, by directing us, being the one who leads us and guides us to truth. He is the straight and the narrow way to the throne of God. It's only in this race, we don't worry about who finishes first or who finishes last. We all want to finish. That's the whole point. And then when we finish, we shall be with him and we will rejoice together in Christ as those who have gone from a dependency in him to the victory in him with a new immortal body that is no more dependent on the things of this earth, no more dependent on medications of this earth, no more dependent of the drugs of this earth, no more dependent on the issues of this earth or the politics of this earth or all of the systems and isms and schisms of this earth because our dependency has shifted to Christ. And in that way, we are most powerful in our dependency in him. Think about it this way, Pearl, and everybody else who's here. You could have uh, electrical uh, uh, equipment, anything. And that equipment usually has an electrical cord that has a plug on it. And as long as that plug remains unplugged to the wall that has the electrical socket, I don't care how big and bad that machine is, it ain't doing nothing. But the moment that that machine shows its dependency and that plug is then put into the outlet, isn't it amazing? how it turns on and it functions in the way that it's supposed to function. Well, we're the same way, everybody. We plug into Christ because he is the ultimate generator that keeps us alive. And as Paul said here in his final words, it doesn't matter whether we're alive on this earth or in death, we're still alive. And we're still connected to the power source of Christ. That's the best kind of dependency we can have. And that's all Paul is trying to say. He wasn't putting out all these things to show just because he preached something that he was all that. He was trying to let them know that it takes all of us to have that same holy boldness to go and to, to share the truth knowing that they're going to throw arrows at you. They're going to throw darts at you. They're going to hate you for his sake. Nevertheless, 
For God I live. For God I die. That has to be the attitude. If it's not the attitude, you don't understand the relationship you have with him. I'm going to cap it off there. Guys, um, <laughs> we are so thankful. Mari, is there anything you need to just add to that? No. Okay. So, yeah. So, we're going we're gonna to cap it off there. Pearl, thank you so much. Thank you, Pearl. Um, you know, um, uh, this was a, a word. I didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't get this really until yesterday. I've been really thinking about it. But, um, nevertheless, God will always provide according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And he does it again. We praise God for each and every one of you. I can't remember right off the top of my head what the word is next week. Uh, I know that we have, um, oh gosh, what's the, uh, I know reconciliation is on the list and deliverance. No, we, did we do deliverance? I can't, re I can't even remember the words anymore. Whatever it is. Hey man, Robert, thank you so much, man. Um, uh, but we, we again, um, we thank you guys. Uh, continue. If you have more words that you want us to cover, we'll do it. That's what we're here for. We, we, we tell our messages towards what the people want and we pray that we deliver. God bless you and God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus. God bless you.